Obrigado. Uh, bom dia. Uh, um sistema não é uma árvore. Meu nome é Kevin Henney. Eu entendo português brasileiro. Minha mãe é brasileira, mas ela sabe nada uh, da ciência e tecnologia. Então, eu não sabe as palavras. So I will do this in English. What I've just given you an example there of is um, something I do with language a lot, normally programming language, and I like words, and there is a term that is very useful for you to know, code switching. This is actually a linguistics term where you change the language you're speaking halfway through speaking something. Okay? I like this because it also relates to software. Because often in the professional world, you end up changing languages partway through a project or just switching from one screen to another. Okay? Not everything is tidy. You don't end up working just in Java, just in C Sharp, or anything like that. You end up flicking screen, and suddenly you're thrown into JavaScript, and then suddenly G CSS, Java, whatever. So, Back to the real point here. A system is not a tree. Um, now, I think we all know what trees are, except that in software, this is what a tree is. They're always upside down. My kids think it's a little unusual when I explain to them, yeah, in software we have trees, and the roots are at the top, and the leaves are at the bottom. And you know, it's just like, you're kidding. No, it's real. Um, whereas in the real world, trees are green, we choose different colors. We have red and black trees. We have data structures. We have all kinds of things uh, to the point that Donald Knuth once observed, trees sprout up about every, just about everywhere in computer science. To the point that XKCD had this wonderful um, one a few years ago. It's a Christmas tree with a heap of presents underneath. So we see them everywhere. We see them even in the most overspecified data structures of the industry. The stack has got to be the most overused abstract data type. So here's a stack of books. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to create a tree from a stack. And then we're eventually we're going to get to the idea of other trees that we, have deal, we deal with, but also when trees stop being trees. So here's a simple stack. There's two elements and then nothing. That's A. We're going to push onto that. We've now got a stack of three items. B equals A. Now, at this point, you realize you're sharing representation. And we now move, make a move. C equals the pop of A. So far, this looks like a fairly conventional stack, but we're now sharing representation. So what we're going to do is we're also going to take a tour of computer science and software architecture. This is a persistent data structure. Persistent data structure is one in which all changes are preserved. If you're using Git, then basically you're using a persistent data structure. All the previous versions are preserved, which means it looks immutable from the outside. It's also the basis of the Lisp programming language. The Lisp programming language was first implemented in 1960. Perhaps one of the most interesting things about computer science is how little has actually happened in the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, we've done a lot of reinvention, and most of it has been about the same things. So functional programming is very popular these days. So let's have a look. Let's build this. It also works when you go the other way. And this is where we get the tree from. You keep on doing this, and eventually in memory, you get a tree, or you get a tree. It turns out trees really are everywhere. We use them extensively, to the point that an observation made by Michael Jackson, and you might be familiar with Michael Jackson um, from Thriller or maybe Bad. It turns out in his spare time, he was also a requirements engineer. Um, and in the 1970s, he came up with Jackson structured programming. In the 1980s, he came up with Jackson system design. Uh, in the 1990s, he wrote this book, um, quite a brilliant book, with a very boring title. 
This is the kind of title that sends you to sleep. But there's a little hint here that there's a little more to this. A lexicon of practice, principles, and prejudices. This is really a book of over 70 short essays, from half a page to about three pages long, where he explores in alphabetical order various ideas in computing, in requirements, and in engineering. And the whole book starts off with the word arboricide. Now, arboricide is not a common English word. In fact, I think, I think that Jackson actually invented it for the book. Arboricide is the murder of trees. And his perspective is that the victims of arboricide are the descriptive tree structures, so often found in software, holding together many individual elements in one coherent and immediately understandable harmony. The idea that we, as human beings, enjoy working with trees. It gives us a hierarchical system in which we can reason. But the problem is a lot of code, and a lot of coding constructs break this, and therefore it breaks our ability to understand it. And he has this wonderful observation. Software development should not be a trade, should not be a profession of constructing difficulty from simplicity. Quite the contrary. Now, honestly, I've worked in software development um, for 30 years, and I have to say that most of the time I see people constructing difficulty from simplicity. Normally inside every complex system, there is a small, simple system that somehow somebody forgot to build, and it's just got built on. So where there are trees to be shown, classification trees, trees of organization, trees of architecture, you should show them and refrain from turning the relationships they describe into a puzzle. Now, this idea of creating complexity is, a, is an enduring theme. So Jackson wrote this in the 1990s. In the 1980s, Frederick Books uh, republished, oh no, he published a couple of essays that were then collected into um, the uh, second edition of the Mythical Man Month. And he made this, this observation. Let us examine software's difficulties. Following Aristotle, so it turns out that software developers go all the way back to ancient Greece, I divide them into essence, the difficulties inherent in the nature of software, and accidents. What he's saying here is there are two kinds of complexity that any software system will deal with. One, one side is the essence, the actual problem that you are dealing with. If you are working on a system that is scheduling, so um, I've just looked at some of the companies out there, and there's a, uh, a wide range. I'm going to pick on one, uh, Siemens, partly because I do work for Siemens. Um, I work for myself, but I, uh, about half the time I work for Siemens uh, on things. One of the one of the interesting things is Siemens does a lot of different kinds of work. They deal with railway scheduling, railway systems. The complexity of that domain is all to do with trains. You don't get to choose that. That is the essential complexity. If you are trying to write a system for banking, then the essence of that domain is banking. It's the rules of banking. It's the legislation associated with banking. It is the practices of banking and accounting. That's what makes that complex. You don't get to choose those. What you do get to choose is the complexity of the technical solution. And that's where we fall down. This is what's referred to as accidental complexity. The complexity that is to do with our choice of technology, our choice of design, our technical debt, all of these things, that is the accidental complexity. It doesn't have to be there. And as Brooks noted, he said, how much of what software engineers now do is still devoted to the accidental as opposed to the essential? Now, what is interesting here is that that was in 1987. Nothing has changed. It's over 30 years, and the same question, um, I, still, I think, still stands. So let's go back to the 1970s. Look at structured programming. This book was published in 1971, 72. And here we can actually see 
the tree style of reasoning coming out. One of the most powerful mechanisms for program structuring is the block and procedure concept. Everybody is so used now to dealing with blocks, begin, end, open curly, close curly, that they even forget that this was not assumed. The first programming language I used, well, no, not the first programming language I used, the first programming language I was paid to use was Fortran. And this is a language that does not understand this concept. It is ridiculously hard. But the idea is very, very old. Block structured programming, this is a forgotten programming language from 1948. You can see why it didn't catch on. It's very difficult to type. So it was mostly a theoretical language. It was developed by Konrad Sousa. It's called Plan Calcul. But if you look, you can see the blocks. They are actually physically nested. There is a tree structure here. We can, I can even translate this for you. This is um, uh, Ord. Uh, it's short for Ordnung, which is the German for sort. It turns out that if you look at I went through this closely. This is actually a bubble sort algorithm. And I think we can forgive Konrad Sousa for implementing a, uh, a bubble sort because quick sort was not due to be invented for another 11 years. So I think he's OK. And if you look here, you see the W. That's while, or in German, it's Wiederholung. So these blocks are repeated. These are conditional branches. If, this, else, that's a not, that. So this is how people were originally thinking in the late 1940s, what might be possible. But block structured programming only became a thing in the 60s, and even then, its influence was not fully felt until the late 1980s. And part of the reason it is so powerful is because of the tree structure. Part of the reason that people get very upset is this act of arboricide, go to, or break, continue, and early returns. The whole go to discussion, go to is an act of arboricide. And it dates back to 1968, one of the most famous letters ever published in communications of the ACM by Edsger Dijkstra. Go-to statement considered harmful. What is interesting about this is that this is another opportunity to showcase a word. So I, as I said, I run this uh, page, Word Friday, on Facebook, where I talk about words and language. One of the words I profiled a few years ago is a snow clone. This is a very unusual English word. But what it means is it's a template phrase. It's a phrase that you repeat and you replace parts. One of the classic examples being X considered harmful. So these days, you can go online. You can find blogs, microservices considered harmful, threads considered harmful, all of these things considered harmful. That all started in 1968 with Edsger Dijkstra's uh, letter. And we have these other snow clones. These aren't the Xs you're looking for, Star Wars. X is the new Y. It's X, but not as we know it, and so on. What is perhaps interesting is that this is not Dijkstra's original title. The original title was a case against the go-to statement. It was uh, made a little more exciting for publication. Okay, so that's an example of 1960s clickbait. Okay, a go-to statement considered harmful, much more exciting than this. So this is a view that many people don't have to deal with until you actually have to see a go-to or the equivalent in a piece of code. So let's actually understand this whole paradigm. This is the paradigm of procedural programming. It was explored as an architectural style, main program and subroutine. And this is not a very interesting way of describing the goal. Every paradigm, notice that this is a classification of um, uh, architecture. The goal of the main program and subroutine style, or procedural programming, is to decompose a program into smaller pieces to help achieve modifiability. Honestly, every paradigm has this as their goal. I can't think of a single paradigm that does not have the goal of decomposing a program into smaller pieces to help achieve modifiability. Functional programming, object-oriented programming, logic programming, aspect-oriented programming, all of these, they are all have the same objective. But now it gets interesting. A program is decomposed hierarchically. Ah. Now, that's different. So for example, if you look at something like the relational model, 
that does not decompose its data hierarchically. It's based on a network. If you look at object orientation, classes may be organized hierarchically, but their relationships are organized as a network. So there is a distinction here. The goal of procedural thinking is to decompose hierarchically. This is structured programming. And we can kind of see this kind of main program, subroutine. And obviously, we have different words for subroutine. Um, but there is actually an architecture here that many people overlook. And this comes about because of the tree structure. The afferent branch, the transform branch, the afferent branch. Translated, input, process, output. This is a very old idea. We see the same character, whether we call them subroutines or functions. It also turns out this is exactly the same architecture, architectural structure of a functional program. It turns out that procedural and functional programming have a lot more in common than people originally thought. But this is where it starts getting messy. Trees are convenient. But we don't always have trees. This is an ideal program. This is the kind of program you find in books. Real programs are a little bit messier, and for good reason. You mix layers. You have recursion. It turns out they're not perfectly hierarchical. They're a bit hierarchical, but not perfectly. So this is a classic book uh, on artificial intelligence, cognitive science, art, and it's absolutely stunning, uh, brilliant book. Um, I have two copies because my original copy has started, this is my original copy from the 1970s, well, 1980s, it's falling apart. So I, I've had to get a second book, but there's a, a really nice observation Hofstadter makes. A program which has such a structure in which there is no single highest level is called a heterarchy as a distinguished from a hierarchy. There is an idea that perhaps complex systems don't have a root. Perhaps it gets to the point that it's not just the edges that get messy. Perhaps the bottom gets, or the top, gets messy as well. So Alan Perlis, the first recipient of the uh, Turing Award in the 1960s, made this observation. One of the things that's quite valuable about the difference between describing something and building something, everything should be built top down tree style, except the first time. What he's observing is that top down is a great way to describe a way that something is organized. But that may not be the best way to build it. There may be a different story behind the construction, because you're exploring. You don't yet know what you are building. And if you don't yet know what you are building, then you have this problem. Tony Hoare observed, you cannot teach beginners top down programming because they don't know which end is up. You have to develop and discover the direction of your code. As human beings, we have these conveniences. We like to organize things in trees. We like to organize things in nested groups. And we use these physical terms. But code has no up and down. That doesn't make any sense. There's no gravity in code. So how do you know which is up, which is down? You have to learn the metaphor. So let's go a little bit further than the traditional view of structured programming and start messing about with some of the ideas that people forgot were part of structured programming. So a procedure which is capable of giving rise to block instances which survive its call will be known as a class. And the instances will be known as objects of that class. So here's an interesting idea. The original idea of calling functions on a stack, if you have functions on a stack, they have state. You lose that state when you return from the function. There was an observation here. What if you don't lose that state? What if the block stays alive? Then the block contains data and it contains functionality. And what if you name that block? So this is the beginning of object orientation. This is Simula 67. So object orientation actually grew out of the idea of blocks, which are these convenient nested structures. In fact, you can uh, 
even see it, a call of a class generates a new object of that class. If you've ever programmed in Python, you'll recognize that this is actually still the case in Python. Just using the name creates the instance. If I want to build a stack, I'm going to use JavaScript. I want to use it, build a stack. One of the ways I can build it is exactly like described. I have a function. I have the data. I now return a set of methods. Or rather, I return a structure that holds lambdas. And I can change the implementation and have exactly the same behavior. So this is originally structured program. It comes out of all that nice tree structure, all the indentation, something you take for granted. People forget why they indent code. Indentation comes from the idea of block structure, which comes from the idea of trees. It allows us to conveniently structure and organize these things. It allows us a hierarchy so we can fold things away if we don't care about them and open them up when we do. An interesting observation by Bill Cook. Bill Cook, a few years ago, was Lambda Calculus was the first object-oriented language. I just used Lambdas there. Lambda Calculus dates back to 1932. So what we've seen in the last decade is that almost every mainstream programming language has adopted Lambdas about three quarters of a century after they were invented. Like I said, there's very few new ideas in computer science. Look for the old ones. So we can actually capture blocks and pass them around. So let's have a look at something else that is hierarchical. Concatenation is an operation defined between two classes, A and B, or a class A and a block C, and results in the formation of a new class or block. What is interesting here is they don't use the word inheritance. That had not, this was not yet standard. This is the word concatenation, the idea that you take a class and you concatenate, you merge the attributes, and you override the methods. It's a very simple idea, and yet surprisingly powerful. And actually, quite literally, you can do this concatenation in JavaScript. I can take a base object. I can then extend it with new operations. And I can create multiple types of things. I can take a stackable. I can take an empty thing. I can make it stackable. I can also have something that is clearable. I can give it two capabilities. So now I can create something that is stackable and clearable. So far, this looks like a tree structure. But then we start looking closer, and we realize that we can just make it as a composition. In other words, we lose the perfect tree. We actually end up with something that derives from many things. The tree has been turned upside down again. And it also shows us a merging point between object orientation and functional programming, again. And how did they propose you organize this stuff? Now, sometimes when people are introduced to object orientation, they think in terms of reusing code. But here in the beginning of the 1970s, it was very clear how you should think about this. You should organize your concepts, concept hierarchies. Focus on abstraction. So you create trees. Now, the problem here is that sometimes people get a little bit distracted by the tree idea of inheritance. So here's an example that I use. It's one of the oldest examples. Um, I think it goes back to the 1970s, possibly even the 1960s, for a software system. Um, it's one of the ones that people still use in universities, a library system where you borrow books. Now, a colleague of mine a few years ago, I remember he said to me, he said, Kevin, you're still using the library example. And I said, yes. He said, you should really change your examples. Move with the times. I said, oh, what do you use? He says, I use a video rental store. I had to explain what a video was to my children recently. Yeah, it's just that like it's definitely this is going to be an example that's going to last a long time. So I want you to think for a moment. You have a member of a library. You have a book copy that you can take out. And you have an arrangement between them alone. But you want to factor out things. Perhaps you want to be able to test things more cleanly. Perhaps you want to be able to generalize a concept. So you move these things out. And you say, I'm going to have an interface here. Alone is going to be an arrangement between two interfaces. Book, copy, and member are concrete realizations. And then what do people name these things? This is possibly one of the most popular ways of doing it. <laughs> 
This is a terrible way to do this because all you've done is you've avoided the naming collision. You haven't actually identified the concept. What is the concept here? This was the idea behind hierarchical thinking. It's not to avoid the name collision. Giving your class and your interface the same name that just differs by one letter was not the original idea. It also has an unfortunate side effect. It makes people think when they look at the code. When they visualize it, they think in terms of these trees. This is a tree, not a very exciting tree, but there could be other things here. And, and the same on the other side. And sometimes people use the names differently, but it's still the same problem. The problem here is that the relationship is not about the vertical, it's about the horizontal. The relationship is from the point of view of loan. It is a borrower, someone who borrows, and someone, something that is loaned, a loanable or a loan item. So sometimes if we approach some things as trees, then it will distract us. It'll show us the wrong thing. This is actually not about the hierarchy. This is about the network. We see a similar thing. This is something that I've encountered in a couple of organizations. It's the same problem in both cases. Their architecture was based on a class hierarchy where you have a root with lots of facilities, and then you inherit from it, you add services, and then you have all your domain objects down here that inherit again from this. In other words, you add something at every layer. This is ridiculously complex. It's very hard to test. And it means that every time there is a change up here, it ripples through. It turns out that the right way to view this is this way. Instead of one big tree, you end up with a different approach. You're layering. You have your domain, use services, your services, use your infrastructure. You decouple it. There's still concept and realization, but now the trees are smaller. You plug things together. So the obsession that we have with a tree shows us that perhaps not everything is a tree. Perhaps not everything fits that. Perhaps we need to have other relationships. We need to recognize that we need to go a little bit further. So we're going to go out into the world here. It's an observation I made when people talk about full stack, they often forget either the lowest level or the level beyond the stack, the user. So what I'm going to do, this is a rather unusual cover for this book, but it will also explain the title of this talk. A City is Not a Tree was written by Christopher Alexander. It's an essay he wrote in 1965. And Christopher Alexander is perhaps better known as the inventor of design patterns. Uh, design patterns were originally invented in building architecture, um, not in software architecture, in the 1970s. And this is one of the books that he wrote. But if we go back to a city is not a tree, what he was looking at was trying to understand urban architecture and understand the problems it was experiencing in the 1960s. And as he observes, a tree of my title is not a green tree with leaves. It is the name of an abstract structure. I shall contrast it with, a more, with another more complex abstract structure called a semi-lattice. And both the tree and the semi-lattice are ways of thinking about how a large collection of many small systems goes to make up a large and complex system. And this is the challenge for us, because software always starts off small. But it doesn't take very long for it to get large. It doesn't take, doesn't take much more than one screen's worth of code before you start finding that there are assumptions that do not hold at the larger level. So we might have a very simple view of the world, a simple view of an organization. Um, in fact, uh, it still happens, but I remember the companies I used to work for, there was always an organization chart. Sometimes in English it's called an organogram. It shows you who's at the top and it shows you where everybody is. And it's very simple and it's very tree structured. And it is a complete work of fiction because that's not actually how the organization runs. If you actually look at what people do, it looks like this. But that's surprisingly difficult to put on a diagram. And it doesn't look tidy. But it's real. This is what's actually going on. 
Organizations of people do not work like that because people do not work like that. This is not a human structure. As he observes, the semi-lattice is potentially a much more complex and subtle structure than a tree, which is why we find it difficult to think about. It's the lack of structural complexity characteristic of trees which is crippling our concepts of the city. In other words, trees take us a certain distance, but to get really big, you cannot reason about a city as if it were a simple tree structure. Otherwise, you end up with cities like Brasilia, which is beautiful in the original photographs, but is not so practical now. The reality of today's social structure is thick with overlap. The system of friends and acquaintances form a semi-lattice, not a tree, which explains why it is that all social media databases are non-hierarchical. They are based on the idea that everybody knows everybody else, and they're not even organized around keys. So how do we create a large software architecture? Now, there's a simple idea, a large software architecture. We start with the top level, and then we decompose it into subsystems, and then we decompose those and decompose those. And this is kind of like a nice, simple way in which a software architect might say, yeah, we're going to break everything down. It's beautiful. It's simple. It fits in a Word document. It works perfectly in PowerPoint. And it's totally not how people work. It is not human. It is not the way that a large software architecture can be built. Now, you've got the other extreme, which is to try and have everything that is not coupled at all. That won't work. A system requires relationships between parts. It cannot simply be disparate parts. They have to be connected. Unfortunately, it ends up looking like this. This is how people relate to each other. This is people relationships. Now, I've drawn a bunch of circles here. I want to go back to Christopher Alexander, a book he published in 1964, which was very influential, Notes on the Synthesis of Form. And he talks about this idea of how do you build something large? And here he was not simply talking about building architecture. He wanted to understand systems, systems of people, systems of technology, systems of anything. And what's interesting here is that this is actually very much the way we think about software systems now. But it took us a little bit longer to find out. We may therefore picture the process of form making, the process of creation, as the action of a series of subsystems all interlinked, yet sufficiently free of one another to adjust independently in a feasible amount of time. What he's talking about here is we can relate it to concepts like encapsulation and refactoring and system evolution. It works because the cycles of correction and recorrection which occurred during adaptation are restricted to one subsystem at a time. So he's got this idea of loose connection, not a tree structure, but peer-to-peer -peer relationships. And he draws a diagram like this, because it turns out that circles get quite messy. So system one, subsystem one, subsystem two, relationships between them. Now, it turns out that in the 1960s, everybody was drawing diagrams like this. This diagram comes from a different paper. This diagram comes from a paper by Melvin Conway. Melvin Conway, who is best known as the originator of something known as Conway's Law, this is the original paper. Um, it is, it's kind of interesting because very few people ever read the original paper. I do recommend it. It's not very long, um, but it's got a lot of good stuff in it. But this is where he made the observation, 1968. How do committees invent? He said the basic thesis is that organization which design, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. In other words, the structure of how people communicate will be the structure of what they build, will exert a very strong force on what they build. Now, he observed this in 1968. One of the great things we have now is a lot of code in the world with version history. And we can actually go back and look at how these systems have evolved. And they follow pretty much this. They follow how people communicate. They follow the departments that they're in. They follow how close people are sitting together. They follow how close the relationships are in terms of trust. If you trust somebody, you're more likely to be able to change and factor their code than somebody you don't trust. You don't have to build up isolation barriers around the code. And so therefore, 
organizational structure influences software architecture. And in many cases, this has been resisted. I've found in a number of universities uh, that I've visited in the past, um, people often resist this idea of software architecture. They want software architecture to be logical and nice and tree structured. But it's not, it's about people. So what we see is that if we actually want to think, how do we create a project? How do we create a system? Historically, people try to do this by saying, well, let's get some people. Let's draw a picture of the software architecture, see what skills we need, and then divide everything up. Except that that's not how it works. You need to define the structures together. We've found the criteria for structuring of design organizations. A design effort should be organized according to the need for communication. When you structure it, who needs to talk to who? If you need two people to talk to each other, then make sure that they can. If you need something to be shared, then figure out how people are going to share it comfortably. So it's one of the books I co-authored a few years ago on patterns. We explored Conway's law. And we made the observation, in referring to this as a law, the appeal is to a force that will shape a system. It's not a law you have to follow. It's not like the speed limit. It's not that kind of law. It's more like a physical law, rather than as a rule that should be followed as with a community or state. A physical law is something that exerts a force on you. You don't really get a choice about following it or not. The fact that you will communicate with people in order to get some work done is expected. The fact that the style of communication will influence your system structure is the surprise to many people. So, This observation, the force is always there. How do you balance it with other things? And in fact, we can think about it based on the four force model that is often used for aircraft. The four force model for aircraft, aircraft do not defy the law of gravity. Occasionally, I see people say, oh, we've got an approach, and it, it um, cancels Conway's law or we've got an approach and Conway's law does not, is not involved in our system, except that it is. When I fly, I do not defy the law of gravity. I counterbalance it through a system of other forces. You go forward fast enough, you've always got gravity, you go forward fast enough, the shape of the craft will create lift, but it also has drag as a consequence. You balance these right, you get to take off. We can do a similar thing for software. You've got the force of your communication, the limits and its benefits, Conway's law. You've got the effort of design. That's going to push you forward. You've got your technical debt. That's holding you back. And the quality of your practice, how good is the code, how good are your tests, that's going to help you go up. That's the consequence of all of these. So, I mean, it doesn't have, it's not, this is not perfect. It's not like physics. But there is the idea that we've got a system of forces, that when you're actually creating a real architecture, you can't just do a top-down decomposition. That's not enough for a system that is complex. What you need to do is figure out how do people talk? What kinds of pieces of code are going to keep changing? What kind of pieces of code do we need to isolate from other pieces of code? And how are the people interacting with one another? And one of the first really interesting ways of looking at this comes from a, a, a patterns paper from the early 1990s, early to mid-1990s. And it comes from Ward Cunningham, um, a language of competitive development. Ward Cunningham is better known to most people as the guy who invented the wiki. And I think the most interesting thing about the wiki is it is not tree-structured. The whole concept of a wiki is heterarchical. It does not use top-down decomposition. It's based on the idea that if you want to capture the world, then you need something as messy as the world. And what is interesting, I'm not going to go into detail here, but this is one of the diagrams in that paper. It relates the development practices. When many people talk about development practices, they often show you bullet points on a PowerPoint diagram, and they nest things. Nesting is a way of organizing things simply. We like it, it works for our code. It fits in the human head. The problem is, that doesn't work with your practices. These are a set of practices and how they relate to one another. It's definitely not a hierarchy. 
But this, what is most interesting about uh, Ward's paper here is that it predates things like extreme programming. It predates things like Scrum. It basically predates, in fact, we can actually find many of the concepts in here. Um, pair programming. Work queue. The work queue is better known these days as a backlog. So if you look at this paper, what you recognize is there are a number of different practices that have gone into the Agile community that go, actually go back to the early 1990s. And many of these, although Scrum dates to around 1990, they were not as formalized uh, at that stage as they are here. We actually see how people interact over different features. Some of them are very technical. Right down here, we talk about test fixture. Ward Cunningham is very big on unit testing, long before test-driven development became a popular concept. But we also relate it to concepts like our meetings and our product initiative, our product vision. It's a very interconnected diagram. And it shows this is actually how humans work. We do not work in these strict small hierarchies. It tells us something. This is a rather good book. Um, it's about building architecture, not software architecture. But most of the advice in it can be considered to be just as good um, for any kind of software system as any, bu any building system. Uh, properly gaining control of the design process tends to feel like one is losing control of the design process. If you have a tidy development process, as many people try to say, our development process looks like this, and they show you a diagram, that probably doesn't reflect how it actually works, and it probably doesn't reflect how people think and communicate with one another. The way that people actually communicate and think is a lot messier, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do it. So I'll close with this observation. Again, from Christopher Alexander, he says, in simplicity of structure, the tree is comparable to the compulsive desire for neatness and order that insists the candlesticks on a mantelpiece be perfectly straight and perfectly symmetrical about the center. And this is perhaps how you organize your home. But that is not good enough for a large system. That kind of local symmetry does not scale. The semi-lattice, by comparison, is the structure of a complex fabric. It is the structure of living things. The human body is not hierarchical. Of great paintings and symphonies, they are not strictly hierarchical. They have localized hierarchies and structures, just as code does. Code, in other words, think about it rather than as one big tree that is elegantly decomposed. What you need to do is think about localized little trees that have complex interrelationships and to reason about those. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple of questions, Pedro. So guys, we have time for just a few questions. Is there anyone that would like to ask something about Mr. Hannes' work or his talk? Raise your, raise your arms. I know it's after lunch. I know your body is going slow and your brain. Awesome. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, you. I really like these concepts of computer science. And as you said, they are completely universal. So my question to you is, uh, how can we use these uh, structures, ideas about structures from computer science to start making our world a, lead more, a little bit more messy in terms of how it works, in terms of the organizations? And Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, yeah, we like the tidiness. The tidiness has its place, but it is at one end of a scale. <laughs> Things get more messy, and then they merge into chaos. The bit we want is here. The problem that we have is that sometimes we overshoot. Whenever we try something, we either overshoot in that direction, we've made it too simple. It's not, it doesn't, it's not complex enough to handle the possibilities. In other words, we've made it hierarchical where it shouldn't be. But we also want to make it messy. The problem is we can make it too messy. That, that becomes the issue. So let's talk about machine learning for a moment. Machine learning is very messy. Okay? It's also creating a bit of a mess in certain parts of the world. Um, 
there is this interesting question because it is non-hierarchical. Um, a machine learning structure is not something that you can easily reason about. So we have this kind of interesting challenge. We want to add a little bit of messiness, but enough that we can still think about it. Yeah, not so much that we can no longer control it, because otherwise we are now being controlled by the system rather than the other way around. So that tells us why it is we like things to be simple, because when we create software, we like to think that we are in charge of the software, not the other way around. But what we're discovering is that if we make it too complex, too messy, it goes the other way around. We end up being controlled by our system. So at the moment, I would say we are doing a good job of making things messier. Perhaps the problem is, how do we slow down? How do we figure out where the stop point is? And to that, I don't have an easy answer, I'm afraid. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of difficult because people, I think part of it is education. Because I think people are taught there's just a simple way of doing something, then they arrive in the world and it's not simple. So they're never shown all the colors, all the shades that take you across this. So people find themselves trying to bring these two different worlds together. The world of the mess that humans make and the world of code, which is very tidy and typically is more hierarchical and organized. I think, first of all, we need to show people the bits in the middle. When they start appreciating that there are these shades of gray, then I think they may make a better effort at designing it. But that's only a theory. Any other questions, thoughts, ideas, solutions? If you have a solution, we'd love, we'd love to know. Uh, Kevlin will be outside, outside in the showcase area. If you want to ask him another uh, round of questions, feel free. Right now, we're going to present a prize to one of you. So I ask a round of applause for Kathleen. Thank you very much. Thank you.